Welcome to the second of these three programmes I'm doing about the interiors of Buckingham Palace. I'm going to be showing you photographs I took of the interiors of the palace and telling you a bit about the story of the decoration of each of the rooms. Today we're going to start in the Marble Hall, which you can see here on the plan is the long space beneath the picture gallery. And so this leads us then into the Minister's Stair to the right, and then moving upstairs, we'll go through the Royal Closet, which is a secret and private room which people never, never see. We're very lucky. Um, and then through Nash's great reception rooms, looking at the garden, and into Queen Victoria's ballroom extension on the left there, the vast room on the end. So here we are back in the Grand Hall, where we were last time. Um, and this is a photograph taken in 1873, still showing the ceiling with its polychrome Renaissance-inspired decoration by Professor Gruner. And off to the left, you can see through the columns, there is what is called the Marble Hall. The Marble Hall is named that because it was intended for the display of sculptures, which were often known as marbles at the time, after the ancient Roman marble fragments that were brought back by grand tourists in the 18th century. The long space corresponds to the plan of the picture gallery on the floor above. And while that was intended for the display of paintings, this was intended for sculpture. The walls in here were originally plain buff scagliola, which must have made a very good background for the white marble columns, rather better than the white paint that was added by King Edward VII in 1902. He also added all of these gilt mouldings. Now the carved Grinling Gibbons style swags and festoons of fruit and flowers in the foreground here, those actually came from the centre room upstairs, added by Queen Victoria, but they may even originate in the Duke of Buckingham's old house. Well, they're rather good quality, but they're not really very well placed, and they rather overwhelm the simple neoclassical fireplace designed by Henry Holland for Carlton House, one of a pair. The portrait over the fireplace is of Uncle Leopold, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert's uncle, Prince Leopold of Saxe-Coburg, here painted while he was the husband of George IV's daughter, Princess Charlotte of Wales, who would have been the heir to the throne had she lived, but she died in childbirth in 1817, so that her cousin, Queen Victoria, became queen eventually. The gilt gesso tables flanking the fireplace were made by James Moore for George I's drawing room at Kensington Palace. They've been here in Buckingham Palace since 1912, when Queen Mary rearranged the furniture. On the fireplace is this wonderful clock made by Vuglimi with Derby biscuit porcelain figure of Andromache holding an urn. Now this is very similar to one bought by the Prince of Wales in 1784 for 90 guineas, which is a huge amount of money at the time. This particular one was left by Lord Melbourne in his will to Queen Victoria when he died in 1848. Lord Melbourne's mother had been a very great friend of the Prince of Wales um, at the time that the clock was made, and one rather wonders whether there's a, a connection there. Flanking the central door, um, leading through to the bow room and then into the garden, are these wonderful portraits painted by Winterhalter in 1859 of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. And then next to them, these extraordinary vases on pedestals they look rather Russian, but apparently they're actually English. And what looks like malachite is actually stained walnut. The whole thing is made of wood. They are perfume burners, made around 1800. And at the time, people needed a lot of perfume burning in their houses to counter the terrible smell of the candle wax. And the square bases pull open with some built-in steps so that the footman can climb up and put a pastel of perfume to burn in the top. The tables beneath the portraits were made by Jean Pelletier for Hampton Court for King William III in 1701. On the left here is a hall chair from Carlton House made in 1790 and it looks rather as if it might have been designed by Henry Holland and on the back is Queen Victoria's cipher 
has been painted on afterwards. And then on the right, a portrait of the Prince of Wales, aged 27, in a uniform of his own design. He was always very keen on designing his own uniforms. And in the back, there's some splendid battle going on, which, of course, he never saw. In front of him is the nymph Dieci, um, carved by Canova in 1822, or at least the head carved by him. The body had been modelled by him, but was actually carved in marble after his death by an assistant. Here is the prince's brother, the Duke of Sussex, painted in 1811 by Domenico Pellegrini. On the right is an enamel vase, a gift of the last emperor of China, that boy king, Puyi, when he was aged five. So presumably he didn't actually choose it himself, but it was sent to King George V in London at his coronation in 1911. In front of the portrait, another Canova nymph, this one commissioned by Lord Corder in Rome in 1802. And poor Lord Corder was very unfortunate with his commissions from Canova. He also commissioned a Cupid and Psyche, that's one of Canova's most famous pieces, and that was seized by Marshal Murat, Napoleon's brother-in-law. And this one was taken from Cordor, slightly more civilly. It was requested from him by the Prince Regent in 1815, and so he reluctantly agreed. Um, and in 1817, it came to England on the same ship as Canova's Three Graces, which ended up in Woburn Abbey. This nymph, instead, was placed in the Gothic Conservatory at Carlton House, which is seen here in a painting of the space, 1817, by Charles Wilde, immediately before the nymph arrived. And you can see this extraordinary Gothic tracery, all done in cast iron by John Nash. Here's the third Canova in the Marble Hall, and this is Mars and Venus. It was delivered in 1824 to the Gothic Conservatory at Carlton House, where it stood for only three years, and eventually was placed here. And this had been commissioned from Canova during an audience with the Prince Regent when Canova came to London after the Battle of Waterloo. Canova was happy to oblige the Prince Regent with his request for a commission, because he owed him a great debt of gratitude, since Canova had been appointed by the Pope to try to recover all of the art that had been looted from Rome by Napoleon, and it was all sitting in Napoleon's great museum in Paris. And the French were very, very unwilling to part with all of this. And when they had actually forced the French to agree to release all of the artwork, to be sent back to Rome, there was then the problem that Rome had no money to pay to bring it back. And so the Prince Regent stepped in and gave 200,000 francs to ship it all back. So the Pope was very grateful. The huge candelabra flanking the doorway, those were made by Bogatz and Storr, Paul Storr, the famous goldsmith, in 1807 for the old throne room in Carlton House. The minister's staircase itself was added by Bloor. Here it's shown in 1913, with a bust of the then just late King Edward VII at the bottom of it, and above is this tremendous stained glass window, which you can see a detail of on the right. And this was a memorial window commissioned in 1903 by Queen Alexandra and King Edward to the eldest son, the Duke of Clarence, Prince Albert Victor, who had died aged 28 in 1892. This is a tremendous piece of late Victorian stained glass. Unfortunately, it was damaged during the bombing raid in the war in 1940, taken down and put into storage. A few years ago, it was rediscovered and put in the Museum of Stained Glass in Ely. So today, where the window was, hangs this great John Hopner portrait of the Prince of Wales, aged 34, in 1796, dressed in the robes of the Order of the Garter. And this hung in Carlton House in the old throne room, where you can see it here on the left, facing a portrait of the Prince's favourite brother, the Duke of York. On the far wall, you can see those two beautiful gold candelabra that we saw at the foot of the stairs just now. So at the top of the minister's staircase, we find ourselves in this small octagonal vestibule that opens in to the picture gallery, but also has a hidden jib door, and which I've just opened a touch on the left here, and that leads in to the royal closet. And on the door is an enamel copy 
of a Winterhalter portrait of Prince Albert. In the right-hand picture is another portrait by Winterhalter, this time of Princess Alice, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert's second daughter, aged 18 in June 1861. Her father died that December, and the following July she was married to Prince Louis of Hesse in a wedding that was described in Queen Victoria's diary as more of a funeral than a wedding, because, of course, the whole court was in deep mourning for Prince Albert, and the Queen almost refused to go to the wedding at all, and then only agreed to go if she could be screened from view. And poor Princess Alice wrote in her diary that she felt terribly guilty, that on occasion she might have looked a bit happy on her wedding day, which was too cruel to her poor mamma. The royal closet is a secret hidden room that no one ever gets to see, and it's used by the royal family to assemble before some state occasion or some reception, and they all gather in here and then emerge from this hidden room into the white drawing room to greet their guests. Actually, in the room itself are some real treasures. On the left, a bookcase made by a man called Bernard Molitor. The fireplace was one of a pair supplied by Dominique Daguerre in 1787 for the great drawing room of Carlton House, and probably specified by Henry Holland, who worked with Daguerre. Holland was the architect of the house, of course, and Daguerre was the marchand mercier, basically a kind of interior decorator. He would have a, a stock of work, and he would also commission new pieces. And so this fireplace had originally been designed by an architect called Bélanger in Paris for the Duchesse de Mazarin in 1781. And so this one, six years later, made in white and grey marble and with gilt bronze. And then these wonderful figures of female satyrs in partially gilded bronze. And then on the mantel shelf, on Pierre Clock, with a figure of Apollo holding his lyre. And this was bought probably from Lignereux, who was the partner of Dominique Daguerre, and who had a furniture showroom in Paris, and that was thronged with English visitors during a brief peace in 1803. And on the right, you see the Pugin office's drawing of the clock from the pictorial inventory drawn up for the Prince Regent to help him to furnish Windsor Castle and eventually Buckingham Palace. And here it says down the bottom that it's from the Gothic dining room, the basement story of Carlton House. And above it says, His Majesty's private property. And then sketched around the clock is a, a glass vitrine. There were vitrines made to cover all of the clocks at a certain point. And then someone, is it the prince perhaps, has sketched a sort of a continuation. Is it a flame coming out of that candle thing on the left? And he was clearly intending to improve this. This is the royal closet shown in 1873. And at that time, you can see the original fire dogs are still sitting in front of the fireplace. And those are still in the Royal Collection. Where they are today, I don't know. But here they are in a picture from the Royal Collection website. Here's a, a, a great cabinet with Pietro Dura in the doors that comes from Carlton House. And the far door there is the one leading through into the white drawing room. Here a detail of the ceiling on the left and Nash's extraordinary plasterwork with these freestanding flowers on stalks. And on the right, a little cabinet filled with some of Queen Mary's collection of 18th century bibelots. And here on the left, a glazed cabinet made for Queen Mary um, in the 1920s to hold some of her collection of jade pieces. And on the right, you see the Queen sitting with her collection of jade pieces in that cabinet in her sitting room at Buckingham Palace in 1924. And now here we're moving into the white drawing room through what's probably one of the most elaborate jib doors in the world. And so a jib door um, is a sort of secret or hidden door. And this one has not only a massive mirror attached to it, but also this extremely heavy cabinet, probably made by Martin Carlin in the sort of late 18th century and then supplied by Daguerre to Carlton House. So it's always something of a surprise when guests are gathered in the white drawing room, waiting for the royal family to appear. And suddenly, this massive piece of furniture starts to open very slowly, and then they process out from the royal closet. It's rather a magical sort of moment. And here is the blue velvet room at Carlton House. Between the windows, you can see two of those Carlin cabinets before they were altered and extended and had new bases put on. So here is the white drawing room today,
with the jib door through to the royal closet firmly closed, as it usually is. In front of it is this wonderful Riesener desk, made about 1775 and bought by King George IV in 1825 as having belonged to Louis XVI of France, which it very probably didn't, but it might have been made for one of his sisters. One of them owned a desk that's now at Wadston, the great Rothschild house, that's very similar. Now this room, the pilasters, originally did not have all that fussy decoration in the panel and set into them. They were just plain shafts of golden sienna yellow scaliola, and they must have looked rather fantastic. Now the portrait of Queen Alexandra over the fireplace was painted by Francois Fleming, who was a great painter of the time, in 1908. That's hung here since 1949. And the candelabra on the left, standing on this giltwood pedestal with three cranes, three giant birds, holding it up. And those were made for the Prince Regent, who had just become Prince Regent, and delivered in June 1811 to Carlton House in time for the fete to celebrate the Regency. This is a detail of that Riesener desk and the gilt bronze basket of flowers, and the wonderful marquetry, and different colours of wood. And probably originally the different bits of wood were actually stained with actual colours. And all this French furniture of this time was actually quite colourful and all the colour has faded, and we're left with various tones of, of natural wood. Here we see again Queen Alexandra surveying the room, and you can see also the plaster frieze above, with sculptures of Putti, and they're all carved by a man called William Pitts, symbolising poetry and music, and all very poetic concepts. But when Nash was hauled before Parliament, before the committee criticised his spending on this lavish royal project, the parliamentary report described these as the sports of boys, costing £800. Here's another of those Carlin cabinets, extended in order to fit the space and fitted with mirrored shelves. And then on the right, this extraordinary object, a perfume burner probably, and it's some Chinese export porcelain cobbled together with some very unusual gilt bronze mounts with sunflowers made for the saloon at Brighton. In the white drawing room are these two pairs of wonderful gilt bronze candelabra, the one on the left from a pair ordered from Tomia, Napoleon's bronze maker by the Prince Regent in 1813 at the height of the war with France, and it's obviously a very military-looking candelabra with these Roman armour and spears and then fasces as feet and Roman swords. And it's sort of an ironic idea that the Prince Regent, who saw himself as the commander of this coalition dedicated to defeating this terrible French emperor, should have ordered things from the French emperor's bronze maker during the war. And then on the right, the sphinxes on the base of another candelabrum, this one made by Pierre Gautier, and one of a pair that were given to Queen Mary for Christmas in 1943, at the height of the Second World War. In the white drawing room is a wonderful pair of sofas that were made for Carlton House, which you can see here on the left in that same blue velvet room. And in here also, in the blue velvet room on the left there, you can see this extraordinary astronomical clock in white marble. And we'll see that in the blue drawing room. Now, the two fireplaces in the white drawing room, designed by Flaxman, the great sculptor who died in 1826. They were probably carved by Westmacott instead. And a great deal of Sèvres. Here we are in the music room, which was originally known as the saloon. And this room has this wonderful suite of seat furniture made by Jacob, a great Parisian furniture maker in 1780 and supplied for Carlton House for the great drawing room. And so here is that room, still with its architecture as designed by Henry Holland, but its decoration rather altered and being used here as the council chamber for the Regency Council. This decoration with all this crimson velvet dates from 1813. And so here you can see the Jacob armchairs drawn up to the council table and then on the right, there are four niches with the sofas pushed back into them.
rather intimate seating. And here is the saloon, as it was still called, in 1843, with all of the sofas and chairs covered in scarlet slip covers. Here are the furniture today, and the blue column shafts are again in scagliola, and these are the only bits of scagliola left in the palace today, as all the rest of it has been painted over or replaced. But these were renewed by a wonderful scagliola company called Hales and Howe a few years ago. And they're supposed to look like lapis lazuli, and they rather do. And you can see here how the room seems to have been rather planned around those four sofas from Carlton House with these mirrored niches, which they push back into. Here is the garden front of the palace during a garden party given by Queen Victoria in 1887. The music room is that rotunda bay protruding from the center. And so here, reflected in the mirror, you can see that rotunda front that pushes out into the garden. And on the right, a detail of the plaster work. And you can see on the dome, there's this trellis filled with the national flowers of England, the rose, Scotland, the thistle, and Ireland, the shamrock. Here, a detail of one of the fireplaces. And on the right, a detail of the wonderful parquetry floor in satin wood and white holly inlaid with tulip and rosewood, making a cipher for King George IV. Here in the window is this wonderful blue Sevres potpourri vase bought from Tomir again in June 1812, and another magnificent wartime purchase from the enemy's bronze maker with a blue Sevres vase in gilt bronze and we can see that in the blue velvet closet where it was placed when it was delivered in June 1812 at Carlton House. Now we move through into the blue drawing room. This is the largest of Nash's state apartments. It's been called the blue drawing room since it was hung with flock paper in turquoise on a buff ground. It was described as altogether delightful in colour by Clifford Smith in his History of the Palace, published in 1931. Clifford Smith was the keeper of furniture, I think, of the Victoria and Albert Museum, helped Queen Mary um, with the redecoration and refurnishing of the palace and other royal residences at the time, and wrote this fantastic history of the palace. Not absolutely 100% accurate, as it turns out. Originally, when the room was first done, the Scagliola columns were raspberry red. They were described as rather insultingly, and I think they were supposed to look like porphyry, but they were probably a rather bright porphyry. And then there was crimson silk on the walls, and that the carpet was exactly like this one, although this is a modern reproduction of the original. So the whole room was just a blaze of red. It probably looked rather wonderful, but was then considered too much. And so in 1860, Prince Albert had the Scagliola columns painted like this to look like onyx. Now the great star of this room is this wonderful table. And this was ordered by Napoleon in 1806, part of a set of three designed by his architect Charles Percier. And two of them were of military commanders, one with the modern commanders with Napoleon himself at the centre, surrounded by all his great marshals. And then this is the great commanders of antiquity. And so we have Alexander the Great in the centre. And this is a single piece of Sevres porcelain, enamelled and glazed and gilded. And it's one of the largest pieces of porcelain ever made in a gilt bronze frame um, made by Tomia. And the whole thing rotates on a rather wonderful mechanism. And the Prince Regent, when Napoleon fell, um, heard about this table that was then still sitting at the Sevres factory, and so he decided that he absolutely had to have it. And so he got in touch with Sevres, who said, absolutely not, we will never sell this to an Englishman. And eventually, King Louis XVIII, the restored Bourbon monarch, heard about this and so offered it to the Prince Regent as a gift. He was so pleased with it that then when his coronation portrait was painted by Sir Thomas Lawrence in 1821, he had himself painted touching the table. The portrait shows him in his coronation robes 
which he designed himself for his incredibly elaborate coronation. The blue drawing has very often been used as the setting for photographs of the Queen and other members of the royal family. And here is Cecil Beaton, photographed from behind by, I suppose, one of his assistants, um, photographing the Queen in November 1955. And the Queen is wearing here the great diadem of diamonds that George IV ordered for his coronation as a little thing to be worn on a fur cap while walking in procession to the service. So here is the full height of the room, this tremendous vaulted ceiling, this wonderfully inventive, extraordinary plasterwork designed by Nash. And on the right, a detail of one of the sofas made by Tatham and Bailey for the Crimson Drawing Room of Carlton House in 1810. And here is that fantastic white marble and porcelain and gilt bronze clock which was bought from Lépine in Paris in 1790. Here we can see those faux onyx columns and between them one of four tables that were made by Alexandre Louis Bélanger in 1823 in Paris and bought for Windsor in 1825 at somebody's sale in London. And they cost £1,490 at the time and were then altered by Morrill and Seddon for £399 additional pounds in order to fit at Windsor Castle. And here is Morrill and Seddon's drawing of the crimson drawing room at the castle with one of those tables sitting um, on the pier between the windows. And I suppose that the king must have approved the drawing but disapproved the tables because when they were actually delivered he took one look and said certainly not and they were sent into store. And so when Lord Duncannon was furnishing Buckingham Palace after the king's death he found that these perfectly nice tables were available and so they've been the glory of the blue drawing room ever since. Here's another detail of one of the sofas and on the right a bit of Pietra Dura with a phoenix rising from the flames on a table in that room. Now we're moving into the state dining room and this had originally been designed by Nash as the music room because what is now the music room was designated by him as the saloon and so this as a music room had fireplaces designed by him and carved by Matthew Coates Wyatt, the son of James Wyatt, the architect. And you can see it's got muses holding musical instruments. And then it's got these Masonic triangles down the bottom. And here in the right-hand picture, you can see the view all the way back to the white drawing room. And you can just catch a glimpse of Queen Alexandra in the far distance. Here is the state dining room as originally decorated with pale stone-coloured walls. And you can see at the end of the room the buffet niche where the gold plate was displayed and where servants could come and go. This view is taken in 1843. And eight years later, that buffet niche would be removed to make an access through to the new ballroom wing for Queen Victoria. Here, looking back at the fireplace end of the room, and you can see this ceiling designed by Bloor, trying to mimic the style of Nash and slightly failing. And here on the fireplace, this fantastic clock made by Tomir again and bought in 1810 from him and showing Phaeton, the son of the sun god Helios, driving his father's chariot across the heavens. And here's a detail of that. I think that's one of the most fantastic clocks in the palace. Flanking that clock is a pair of wonderful candelabra made by François Raymond in 1783 for the Comte d'Artois for his cabinet turc at Versailles. The Comte d'Artois, the youngest brother of Louis XVI, was then rather a friend of the Prince Regent when he was living in exile after the revolution in London, living in a house in South Audley Street and supported by a quite generous allowance given him by the prince. On the other mantelpiece, a clock made by Vouliamy in 1811 with Derby biscuit porcelain figures of time and astronomy gathered around a broken marble column. So we're now in the West Gallery 
which is what replaced that buffet alcove at the end of the state dining room um, in 1855, when Queen Victoria had James Pennythorne build her new ballroom extension to the south end of the palace. Pennythorne was Nash's adopted son. and was rumoured to be his illegitimate son, but was absolutely not, in fact. Nash was childless, and his second wife had some cousins um, who had children, and they were the Pennythorns, and so Nash adopted them. And so James Pennythorne became his architectural heir and took over his practice. And so here, this West Gallery is a top-lit, vaulted space, and over the doors here, you see a sculptural group by William Theed, a Venus descending with the armour of Achilles, and she's flanked by a couple of tritums, and so it's British naval power, really. And then on the right, you can see this Boulle-style Bureau Mazarin, a sort of knee-hole desk, um, made in about 1710, bought by Lord Hartford in Paris with its pair in 1807. And Lord Hartford kept the pair and gave this one to the Prince of Wales, who took it to Brighton and used it as a dressing table. And now it's here. And Lord Hartford's pair is now in the Wallace collection. And it has the same Boole marquetry, but it is the reverse. And so what here is brass, there is tortoiseshell. Here at the opposite end of the West Gallery, Theed's sculpture shows the birth of Venus. And now here is the ballroom itself, and it's a vast space, as you can see. Unfortunately, it was altered for King Edward VII in 1902, with not terribly happy results. But it is a magnificent, magnificent space, and it's used mainly now for investitures. And so you can see it here. I photographed it on the morning before an investiture began, and so you can see a whole army of little gold chairs for all of the friends and relations of the recipients of honours. But if we look back to June 1856, and this wonderful watercolour of the second ball given by Queen Victoria in her new ballroom, we can see how it originally looked. And it was really rather splendid. And so designed by Pennythorne, but in consultation with Ludwig Gruner, Prince Albert's art advisor, who's introduced this very strong neo-Renaissance decorative style. And so there are windows above that appear to be engraved, and then these painted panels of the muses, and then below the walls have silk damask. And so the end that we're looking at here had a sort of throne dais, and the opposite end of the room was given over to the organ, now, this organ came from the Royal Pavilion in Brighton, and you can see it on the left there, where you see the Prince Regent sitting between two of his lady friends and a whole band performing in the music room at Brighton. And behind the bandmaster, you can see this enormous organ. And this was the largest and most powerful organ in England when it was built by Henry Cephas Lincoln in 1818. And so it was essential to find somewhere in the palace to put it, after everything had been removed from the Brighton Pavilion when it was sold by Queen Victoria. So Penethorn provided this drawing on the right, showing a new organ case, because obviously the exotic Chinese style of the original case was not suitable. It was actually slightly modified when it was carried out, but here is the organ installed at the other end of the ballroom in a photograph of 1873, and you can see how it's up in a sort of organ loft with a rather delicate metal railing in front of it. And here is the organ today, and it's lost some of its sculpture, and the paintwork has obviously, well, some of it survived, hasn't it? An awful lot of white and gold has been added, and then this rather clumsy balustrade in front. But the organ is still played occasionally, I believe, and the band of the household division play up there during investiture ceremonies. So here is the ballroom photographed in, I think, the early 1920s. And so this shows really what King Edward VII did to his parents' ballroom. And the king was never a great fan of his father's decorating ideas. 
and so he's really let rip here and obliterated almost every trace of Professor Gruner's scheme for Prince Albert. And he had an architect called Frank Verity draw up these uh, overscaled and clumsy door cases. And then the decorating company of White and Allen went to work and changed those plans a little bit and, and came up with this. But what's fascinating for me in this photograph is the throne canopy, which you can see at the end of the room. And this was something that was put together by Queen Mary and the architect Sir Edwin Lutyens in the middle of the First World War in 1916. And Lutyens was having meetings with the King and Queen at the time about his plans for the great new capital of India, New Delhi. The move to Delhi from Calcutta had been announced at the Coronation Durbar in Delhi in 1911. And here on the left, you see the king and queen sitting in the royal pavilion. And they're sitting under this chatri type of structure. And around the edge of it is this canopy, all made of gold-embroidered velvet, designed at the Mayo School of Art in Lahore, which was a great art school. Embroideries were designed with a mixture of Mughal and classical motifs. So on the right is the throne canopy as it exists today. And here the room again set up for an investiture. And so the one fauteuil armchair made by Jacob for Carlton House, part of that whole suite of furniture, which most of which is sitting in the music room upstairs. And this one chair sits there um, on the throne dais for the queen to use during investitures. And then on the left, you can see the kneeling stool, which recipients of knighthoods, um, they kneel there to be dubbed on the shoulder. Here we are in Delhi on the 12th December 1911, and the King Emperor and Queen Empress making their way into the Shamiana, which is the first of these pavilions, with all that embroidered velvet hanging, as you can see. And here, local rulers paying homage to them, and then they moved up into that royal pavilion we saw the photograph of before, attended by these pages who were the sons of the local princes. And isn't it a picturesque and wonderful looking ceremony? And here's the entire parade ground with the two pavilions and then them leaving at the end. Here on the left, a photograph of the throne canopy as it was originally made in 1916. And you can see there are great side panels and today, on the right-hand photograph taken by me, you can see what's left. There is actually some on the dome at the top of the canopy. But apart from that, the only Indian embroidery surviving is that one stripe of it there behind the throne. And the throne itself was made for King Edward VII's coronation. And that was organized by the art dealer Joel Duveen, later knighted turned into Sir Joseph Duveen. Duveen was a sort of interior decorator as well as art dealer, but the only decorating he really did for the king was of Westminster Abbey for the coronation, where he lent the king all sorts of tapestries and carpets to dress up the interior of the abbey. And then he organized for these throne chairs to be made in Paris by the furniture makers Carlion and Beaumetz. Here, yeah, moving on from the ballroom to the ball supper room. This is another enormous space next door to the ballroom. This was originally decorated, of course, by Professor Gruner with another of these neo-Renaissance schemes. And this very amusing watercolour shows a children's fancy dress ball in 1859. And you can see up on the sort of dais um, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert standing watching the children dance in 18th century costumes. The room today um, is, of course, a symphony in white and gold um, for King Edward VII, but it still does retain this incredible, vigorous neo-Grecian plasterwork on the ceiling, which is rather fantastic, and sculptural groups over the door frames. And then it's being used when I photographed it as a furniture store. This is one of the door reveals leading into the ballroom, it's one of the few places where we can still see some of Professor Gruner's paintwork. And it looks rather marvellous, doesn't it, with the Queen's cipher 
in the middle. And then on the right, there is the little thing called the cross gallery, um, which joins the west gallery to the east gallery. And the chairs that you see stacked up in here, some of them are rather newer, I think, but some of them are the original dining chairs from Carlton House, supplied for the Prince Regent in 1813 by Tatham and Bailey, and they're still in use today. There's another of the door reveals, and you can see the soffit there, painted with Prince of Wales feathers, more of Professor Gruner's paintwork, and more of the fantastic mahogany doors with gilt bronze mounts. And then on the right, um, a painting by Benjamin West, the American artist who settled in England. Um, and this was his first commission from King George III, who recommended the subject himself. And it is the departure of Regulus from Rome, painted in 1769. And on the table, a funny little um, candelabra in carved wood, gilded, which looks to me as if it might be a th by Athenian Stuart, but I don't know. Here is the East Gallery, and so this is returning from the ballroom towards the Grand Staircase. And so in the distance there, through the open doors, you can just see Perseus outside the guard chamber. As this East Gallery was originally half its present length, and it joined the planned chapel that was planned by Nash in the upper part of King George III's old Octagon Library. And this was then lengthened by James Pennethorne to join the new ballroom that he built for Queen Victoria. And here you can still see in the upper part of the walls Nicola Consoni's gold ground friezes of triumphs of putti. Um, and those are all that remain today visible of this fantastic decorative scheme planned by Professor Gruner and Prince Albert and it's a sort of a trompe l'oeil pergola with these open arches and then urns full of tumbling flowers and then the pergola walls all done in faux marble. And this wonderful painted scheme is still existing, I'm told, behind the silk that's at present on the walls. So we could hope that one day the silk might be removed and this wonderful paintwork revealed. And this gallery, when it was first built, was called the Promenade Gallery, intended for guests at the balls given by Queen Victoria to be able to promenade between the dances. So here is the existing situation with the walls hung with the silk. And then in the left-hand picture, you can see this enormous clock made by somebody called Delacroix in the 1770s in Paris. And this supposedly was won in a wager by George IV from Chardis of France. Whether that's true or not, who knows? And then reflected in the mirrored door, you can just see Queen Victoria in a copy by Hayter of his coronation portrait of 1838. And then to the right, this wonderful Tomir candelabra delivered to Carlton House in 1813 for the Prince Regent. And you can see it um, by the window in the rose satin drawing room there. And then again in the pictorial inventory. Now, I was lucky that when I went to photograph the palace, this fantastic Van Dyck portrait of King Charles I was hanging in the East Gallery. It's normally at Windsor, but I absolutely love, don't you, the scale of the painting and that enormous sofa underneath. The whole thing is superhuman. And this painting of Charles I with his riding master and equerry, Monsieur de Saint-Antoine, painted in 1632 for the end of the picture gallery at St. James's Palace. I suspect it was probably made more or less part of the architecture of the room. It probably filled the entire end wall of this picture gallery so that it must have looked as if the king was actually riding into the space through this triumphal arch. And he's with Monsieur de Saint-Antoine, who was sent by King Henri IV of France with a gift of horses for the nine-year-old Henry, Prince of Wales, in 1603. And Henri IV was the godfather of little Prince Henry. And then Henry, of course, died aged 18. And so the crown passed to his brother Charles instead. But Charles kept on the French riding master 
who had been sent with his brother's horses. And on the right, we have Winterhalter's great portrait from 1846 of Victoria and Albert and their oldest children, with the Prince of Wales wearing a sort of Grecian tunic under the admonitory gaze of his father. But then the three girls, there's Victoria on the right, who was, of course, the mother of the Kaiser, and then Princess Alice fussing over her baby sister, Helena. Then the painting on the right is Queen Charlotte, Queen Victoria's grandmother, and the original royal inhabitant of Buckingham House. So it's rather suitable that we end with an image of her. And she's shown with her first 13 children. She had two more after this, standing in Windsor Park, and on the left of the group in the background, you see, there is her Prince of Wales and his brother Fred. Well, I hope you enjoyed that further glimpse of the interiors of Buckingham Palace. I love those rooms. I think they're absolutely extraordinary, really worth seeing. But my absolute favourites are the Chinese-inspired interiors in the East Wing. And we'll see them in the next programme, which is the third and last of this little series.